Welcome everyone. I see that all five board members are present, so I'm going to call this meeting of the Green Mountain Care Board to order. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the board, and we'll get started. The first item on the agenda is the executive director's report, and I'll turn it over to Susan Barrett. Thank you, Chair Mullen. To start, I want to announce that there's a slight change in the order of our uh, presentations and on our agenda today. So for your review, First, we're going to hear an update on the Agency of Human Services Workforce Work Plan. Then we will turn to the Vermont Information Technology Leaders Vital FY23 budget. That will include a Green Mountain Care Board staff presentation and a potential vote. Then at approximately 2.30, uh, we will hear from the Department of Mental Health and they're going to provide an update on their work and priorities. And then last, we will um, hear um, on the accountable care organization guidance and also have a scheduled potential vote. So uh, just uh, we will update the agenda after this meeting, but we had to rearrange some of the order and I, I needed to announce that. In terms of public comments, ongoing public comments, we have a couple. First, on Friday, May 6th, 2022, the board received and began its review of the proposed rates for major medical health insurance plans offered to individuals, families, and small businesses in Vermont for 2023, including plans offered on Vermont Health Connect. The board is accepting public comments on these filings. We started on Monday, May 9th and we'll conclude that public comment period uh, on July 21st at 11 59 p.m. You can uh, submit your comments electronically through the rate review website. You can send them by email to gmcb.board at vermont.gov. You can mail them to our address in Montpelier, 144 State Street in Montpelier or you can call at 802-828-2177. All of this information is located on our website under the rate review section. Also, while you're there looking at, if you wanna check out our rate review website, you can also see the filings and then also review the dates for the upcoming hearings, which will take place on July 18th that week. Uh, we'll also have a, a rate review um, public forum. We are also uh, have another ongoing public comment period, and we are seeking public comment to inform a potential future agreement with the state of Vermont, which includes the governor, the Agency of Human Services, and the Green Mountain Care Board, and CMS, uh, more specifically CMMI, on an all-payer model. Uh, the board is encouraging that the public uh, send in any comments you have regarding a next potential model. We uh, will share those comments with our colleagues at the Agency of Human Services and at the governor's office. And that is all I have to announce. I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan, very much. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, June 15th, is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Seconded. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, June 16th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. So at this point, I'm going to um, go to uh, the first um, policy topic on the agenda, and uh, we're going to have a fascinating discussion and get updated on how um, the workforce plan is progressing to date. And for that, I'm going to introduce Ina Backus, the, the Director of Healthcare Reform. Ina, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Good afternoon. How are you all today? Great. <laughs> Good to see Be you. Better Zadie and Sunny. <laughs> it's 
it, it is summertime now, officially, so it should be 80 and sunny. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we if we got that in the spring, we can't have it now. And um, I wanted to um, absolutely take the opportunity to talk with you today about our progress um, with the Healthcare Workforce Development Strategic Plan uh, and to certainly um, share with you where uh, the legislature and the administration um, uh, together supported um, enacting components of that plan via uh, S11, which is now um, known as Act 183, and talk through um, those new investments um, and uh, scopes of work that have been created in that legislation and that are consistent with uh, the strategic plan. But before I dive into that, I did want to talk about some other areas of progress with the plan um, that you're you may or may not be aware of. Um, one of the recommendations in the plan and that has been an objective for a number of years is to formally um, attach the work of the Healthcare Workforce Development Strategic Plan to the statewide Workforce Development Board. And that has happened. There is an advisory group which exists to inform and maintain the strategic plan, as I think you know. And that advisory group has become a subcommittee of the Workforce Development Board. And we are supported in our work by the Workforce uh, Development Board staff, which is um, a fantastic collaboration. And we've already found that by working uh, together in this committee setting, that we can bring, uh, that we're finding we are cross-training, bringing information um, that's uh, relevant to the healthcare sector, but perhaps is um, related to some more broad workforce development initiatives and ensuring that the healthcare um, advisory group is aware of those um, happening. So one example of that is the worker relocation program and the additional funding for the worker relocation program and the policy changes that were also enacted this legislative session to expand or to rather not restrict the definition of um, the most uh, high need worker or working types of jobs. So I don't know if you're familiar with the relocation program and how it was running in the past, but there were certainly uh, dollars that were available for uh, folks relocating Vermont to work, but they were for high need occupations only, and not all of the healthcare occupations were necessarily classified in that way. So now there's no longer that high need classification, which does open the opportunity for healthcare workers and as well as others um, with those um, funds. So that's one place where we've been able to share information um, with the advisory group in this new structure, and that's very exciting. Um, so that I wanted to bring you up to speed on. And we also, as you know, um, in the plan, uh, recommended that there be some investment to support recruitment and retention initiatives for the healthcare workforce in the near term. And those investments were provided for in the Budget Adjustment Act uh, so not within the large workforce development uh, board, but rather earlier in the legislative session codified in the in the Budget Adjustment Act. And that program, um, which is now dubbed the Premium Pay for Workforce Recruitment and Retention Program, uh, was a program that was open for eligible um, service providers for health and human service providers as um, established um, by the legislature. It was open as an application for two weeks at the end of May. That application closed on June 1st, and our staff at the Agency of Human Services are currently processing um, 141 applications for recruitment and retention uh, funding through this program. 
Um, and we are anticipating and targeting um, the announcement of awards by the end of this month, June. And preliminarily, um, I think it, I'll back up and say that the Act, the Budget Adjustment Act 83, it allocated $60 million for the premium pay program for investments in healthcare and human services workforce recruitment and retention. And initially slated 45 million of those dollars for a first round of funding um, that uh, was and provided for program parameters established by the legislature, um, meaning $2,000 per FTE for the qualifying um, and eligible provider types. The second round of funding, um, which was held back as 15 million, would be for needs-based grants, so a different process for determining um, qualifying entities for investing in still in recruitment and retention work. Um, we are it's, we're we're still validating um, the requests, um, but we do anticipate that there will be um, funding remaining. Um, in addition to the $15 million for the needs program, we anticipate additional funds um, could be directed for the needs-based program based on the 141 applications that are being processed now. So that was the other piece that I wanted to be sure that uh, the board understood as something that um, had been introduced as a concept um, and made as a recommendation in the strategic plan and has been executed and is being in the process of being executed through um, both the legislation and the staff's very hard work at the Agency of Human Services. So now I'll, I'll move on to um, walking through um, the initiatives in S11 or Act 183. And I will share my screen if that's okay, or prefer. Yep. Somehow it wound up way at the bottom of my list. And we can see it. Great. So this is a basic chart um, that describes the new initiatives in Act 183 relative to the healthcare workforce and how those initiatives um, may or may not have been reflected in the healthcare workforce development strategic plan. And again, I think that we see a lot of um, alignment between the plan and the initiatives in Act 183 or S11. Uh, the first initiative is emergency grants to support nurse faculty and staff, and this is a $2 million investment um, that provides for interim grants to Vermont's nursing schools over three years to increase compensation for faculty and staff. And this, um, this investment um, is something our, the plan acknowledges um, that faculty compensation may be a barrier to increasing faculty staff for nursing education programs. And this was certainly a topic among the advisory group that informed the strategic plan. Um, the plan did not recommend um, a, an investment or a grant program. However, the plan did uh, create a work group to evaluate any gaps in compensation between academic faculty and practitioners. So uh, acknowledging um, that there is an issue with compensation and that compensation may be uh, hindering, um, hindering nurses from working in these faculty positions and to identify possible solutions and make further recommendations. So the, that group, the work group um, has been convening and was convened, I believe, uh, prior to or consistent with the legislative session opening uh, by the Office of Professional Regulation. The plan, um, the plan asked that the Office of Professional Regulation convene the group 
and there were reports out on the activities of the group um, to uh, to the legislature. Uh, so here we see um, this grant program reflecting an issue from the plan, but certainly um, taking a concrete step beyond the plan. The next um, the next initiative in the workforce development bill um, in section 21, section 21 creates nurse preceptor incentive grants. And these incentive grants are for nurses employed by critical access hospitals in Vermont to serve as preceptors for nursing students enrolled in nursing school programs. Here, another issue that the plan um, that the plan acknowledged um, and provided for uh, it certainly recommended that the work group that I just referred to also um, think about and inform um, the informed strategies uh, to address the issue of there being enough preceptor slots available so that nursing students could obtain their required clinical time. So again, I think that some of the, the work that this group the and those members of the work group, which did include um, faculty from Vermont's nursing programs, uh, and those those individuals also were informing, I believe, the legislation. Um, we see here a concrete recommendation. Uh, in addition uh, to those investments, the director of healthcare reform or designee in the Agency of Human Services is asked or required to convene a working group of stakeholders to identify ways to increase clinical placement opportunities, establish sustainable funding models for compensating nurses as preceptors, or hiring uh, additional nurses to alleviate pressure on preceptors. And this will be a new activity uh, with a report for additional um, action in terms of improving uh, the number of preceptor slots that are available um, due January 15th. Another new grant uh, program and opportunity that was created by the Act is um, a healthcare employer nursing pipeline and apprenticeship program. $2.5 million was appropriated to provide grants to healthcare employers, including hospitals, long term care facilities, DAs, FQHCs, and other healthcare providers to expand uh, partnerships with Vermont nursing schools and create nursing pipeline or apprenticeship programs or both. Uh, that would be available for training members of existing staff, including personal care attendants, licensed nursing assistants, licensed practical nurses, um, to become higher level nursing professionals. So acknowledging that uh, many professionals may be ready to advance in their careers as they are currently em employed, but may need support um, in, in doing so and really needing to meet those um, individuals where they are uh, to support them in advancing in the career ladder. This is a strategy that is, um, again, consistent with themes raised by the Workforce Development Strategic Plan, which included um, developing and identifying strategies to streamline advancement through the nursing career ladder um, and to allow for existing staff to uh, further their capacity and skills as providers. Um, so here the plan looked for there to be a convening of healthcare providers and higher education programs to develop and identify um, a program. And again, uh, the, the legislation here goes goes beyond and provides an appropriation um, specifically for the Agency of Human Services to develop an opportunity. And we certainly will be looking uh, to, to the advisory group and representatives of the advisory group, as well as providers uh, to inform this, this program as we go forward. 
Um, we do have our preliminary work to do uh, with all of these appropriations to ensure that they um, are, you know, we have questionnaires and work that we need to do with the agency of administration prior to implementing any any of the programmatic activities because these funds are ARPA uh, funds and need to be um, and need to be dispersed consistent with uh, the ARPA rules and requirements. We also, also a healthcare workforce data center um, is established by Act 183. The healthcare workforce development strategic plan recommended establishing a healthcare workforce data center. And this provides for $750,000 to establish the center and also creates a full-time FTE for the Agency of Human Services to um, employ a health care workforce data center manager. Uh, further, uh, a limited three-year, uh, a limited service three-year position is created in the Agency of Human Services by Act 183 um, to provide for coordination uh, of the initiatives in Act 183 but also those that are set forth in the healthcare workforce development strategic plan. I'm going to move on now to a large, a very exciting uh, list of investments in, um, in scholarship and loan repayment opportunities. These are two key areas where we made a lot of recommendations um, in the healthcare workforce development strategic plan. And as we continued in discussions and work in this arena um, between the time that the plan was published and uh, you know, even beyond and into the legislative session, we continued to hear very clearly from um, current nurse nursing students, recent graduates um, of, you know, of educational programs in Vermont, uh, new to Vermont healthcare workforce, that financial, financial considerations were chief in their choice of where to work and where to seek um, employment. So we, we see this um, these investments in Act 183 as really being critical components in creating a more competitive environment for Vermont to offer some financial incentive to live and work as a healthcare professional in our state. Um, would you like me to pause before moving into the explanation of these new um, and additional investments in scholarships and loan repayment or or should I continue on? So it depends on what you would prefer. We could ask questions on everything that you've presented up to now, or we can wait till the end. So it's up to you how you want to do it. I could go either way. Well, <laughs> then why don't we ask questions while they're fresh and I'll start off then. Um, why just critical access hospitals for the preceptorship? I don't have I don't have a good answer for you off the bat. Again, this is something that the the, the legislature pursued. We didn't propose this. Um, we didn't propose it. And it does have a link to our plan, um, but I don't have a I don't have an answer for you here about why it why it was just the critical access hospitals. Um, it, I, I I saw it coming together at the end, and it seemed to be an attempt to. Uh, um, help institutions that needed the help versus those that uh, were big enough to uh, afford it themselves. And I just want to say that at least it's this one board member's opinion that some of the smaller hospitals were proportionately reimbursed more from the federal government due to the pandemic um, from their losses than some of the larger ones. And I'll just leave it at that. But I, I know it's not not yours. So I just want to get it out there that that one seems strange to me. Second thing that really uh, raised some hair on the back of my neck was moving the um, oversight of this to um, 
labor. And you were on the board back in 2017 and 2018 when we were trying to get labor's attention and bringing them to meetings to try to focus on this issue. And we didn't seem to get that focus. Are you convinced that today you have their focus? So I, I think, and I can't see you. So, oh, there you are. I apologize. Um, I think that you're referring to the linkage that we made between the advisory group, which is, which is established in Act 155 of 2020, that there be an advisory group to update and maintain the healthcare workforce strategic plan. And, and the linkage that we've made with that advisory group being a, an official subcommittee of the healthcare workforce, or excuse me, the workforce development board. Is that your question? Yes. Yes. Um, I, emphatically, we are we are a subcommittee um, of the board, so we still like the convening of the advisory group is entirely um, consistent with the advisory group's charge. Um, I chair the advisory group, also consistent with. 155 of 2020. So I wouldn't say that it, I, I don't view this um, as, you know, creating oversight by labor. I instead view it as an incredibly helpful partnership and fusing of um, the expertise in the state of Vermont on workforce development broadly. And well, hopefully I, there's been an evolution, but as a former member of the Workforce Development Board for multiple years, and this was going back quite a few years, but I'm just, I was concerned about um, the lack of meaningful movement. And maybe that has changed. And, and of course, we wouldn't see it here, um, but hopefully that has changed. Well, I certainly understand that the the board is, is large and broad. And that is why I think this subcommittee structure is particularly in point, important because there are some targeted and specific investments, uh, excuse me, and specific strategies that are very um, unique to the healthcare sector. And that's why as we work as a subcommittee, uh, we're working with a subcommittee that's comprised of those with expertise in the healthcare sector. We are tied to though, the resources and expertise um, that come with the staffing for the board. And I do think with the workforce board, and I think it's incredibly helpful and incredibly, um, it's, a, it's, I think it's a very good, um, it's well, a there very- there was always incredible talent yeah. on the board. It was just never utilized properly, but that, that could have changed. It's been a lot of years. Um, what commitment do you have from higher ed? We, You've shown us the dollars that go to um, increased uh, faculty compensation and the dollars that uh, go to hopefully increase the availability of uh, precepting. But do we have a firm commitment from the leaders of our college system um, to make sure this happens? Or are they too focused on what I think is this boondoggle of a combination of our state colleges? Well, as I as I already as I should have said um, at the outset, uh, with this with this legislation sort of newly hot off the you know presses and uh, final here, you know the agency of human services. Our our first step, as as I did describe, is for us to really uh, work with our partners at AOA. Um, around the funding source for uh, these investments and go through the proper processes that we need to in order to utilize the SFR and ARPA and SFR funds appropriately. And so that's that's our first step. And then and then we get into the program design um, and the grant opportunities. And that's where we see you know the importance of partnership with um, those members of our partnership some with some who are members of the advisory group and can uh, potentially um, provide some feedback on grant structure, but certainly um, the programming is a piece that we will be working on next. 
and the program design. And the final question I had on what you've presented so far, uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the needs based on that 15 million. Is it the needs uh, of the individual applicant or is it the needs of the institution? It's, it would be the need of, of the employer, um, need, need based based on, yes, employer, not of, not of the employee. Okay, super. Those are my questions. Other board members? I have one question. Um, you, I mean, as we know, the, this workforce problem isn't unique to Vermont or hasn't been unique to Vermont. And so you said that Act 23 uh, uh, makes us more, uh, makes a more competitive environment. Um, but I'm just wondering if we, if we wake up a year and a half from now and find that other states have kind of paralleled what we're doing here in Vermont and that we really aren't any more competitive. It's just that we've all moved in the same you know, direction and kind of raised the platform a bit. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if there's, you know, any kind of ongoing way to really know whether or not we've made ourselves more competitive relative to our competitors. That's a great question. One of the, and another area where we're looking to utilize our advisory group for feedback, but where we've also built in um, with with the recruitment and retention program, for instance, and other states are investing in recruitment and retention uh, as well. So taking that as an example, um, there's quarterly reporting that is required for the recipients of the recruitment and retention funds. And through that quarterly reporting, uh, we will be able to assess the impact of that funding through some um, measurements and uh, information that we'll be collecting. And so with the program design, that's how we've sought to understand the impact um, of, of the dollars. So that's one example. Uh, and I anticipate with these um, other streams of funding that we will similarly be expecting reporting so that we can gauge the impact. Um, when it comes to the scholarships and loan repayment programs, um, that those programs also should be evaluated for their effectiveness, um, certainly, uh, and that, but that is a separate evaluation than what I'm talking about in terms of quarterly reporting related to um, grant funding or the premium pay program. Thank you. Other board members? I had a question about um, the position. I think it's great that you are going to have some help here. That's awesome. Um, and I was curious what level of a position you're thinking that will be. Um, given, you know, obviously it's a three-year limited service. The appropriation I'm assuming is just for the first year, not for all three years. So if you could speak a little bit to what you might be looking for. And another great question, and thank you for that question. Um, we've also begun that work of thinking about, you know, if there's an existing position class, for instance, that um, is applicable here that we can utilize so that we can quickly recruit and fill the position. Um, and we are developing the job description and job duties for the position now. Um, but, at, you know, at, at a high level, we're certainly looking for um, an individual who is familiar broadly um, with uh, the various sectors in the health and human services workforce for which we are, you know, particularly focused. Um, an individual who's familiar as well, I think, uh, with, um, with our partners in workforce development, which definitely includes um, higher education. Thank you. But 
uh, to to just you know kind of summarize, we're in the process right now of developing um, developing job duties and description for the position and going through the process that we need to go to in order to establish a new position and to uh, recruit. Okay, is there other board questions or comments up to this point? Hearing none, Eno, why don't you just proceed? Okay. So again, uh, the Healthcare Workforce Development Strategic Plan uh, recommended certainly increasing um, scholarship funding, broadening and expanding loan repayment um, options to more professional types. And um, there are a number of um, there are a number of programs that are consistent with with this direction as established by Act 183. Uh, the nursing forgivable loan incentive program and the forgivable loans are scholarships. They are scholarship, you know, they are forgivable loans technically, but I think we can think of them as scholarships that are linked to service agreements. So they are for uh, scholarships for students who enroll in an eligible school and commit to working as a nurse uh, in the state and who meet the eligibility requirements. And there's uh, an additional investment of, in this existing program of $227,000. Uh, um, the Vermont Healthcare Professional Loan Repayment Program, um, $2 million is invested in this program and it broadens the program to include nurses, physician assistants, medical technician, child psychiatrists, primary care providers, who meet the eligibility requirements. A nurse faculty forgivable loan incentive program is created. This was not an existing program previously. This program is created for students uh, who are enrolled in an eligible school and who commit to working as a member of the nurse faculty at a nursing school and who meet eligibility requirements. The nurse faculty loan repayment program is also created newly by Act 183. Um, same, same basic um, uh, description of that program. $1.5 million um, is appropriated for mental health professional loan, excuse me, professional uh, forgivable loan incentive program. And this program provides forgivable loans to students enrolled in a master's program at an eligible school who commit to working as a mental health professional in the state and meet eligibility requirements. And finally, $1,250,000 uh, $1, was appropriated for the designated and specialized services agencies to use funds for loan repayment and tuition assistance to promote the recruitment and retention of high quality mental health and substance use disorder treatment professionals. And again, um, the plan, the, the workforce development strategic plan um, uh, does um, again, recommend broadening and expanding loan repayment to more professional types. Members of the board, any questions or comments? Sure. <clears throat> this is Tom Walsh. Uh, thank you, Ina. Um, it, I noticed with all that you presented, it's about um, retaining people who are already working in the in the healthcare field and bringing people in. And um, I'm hoping that with the data center and the data coordinator um, that you that you highlighted that there'll all be also be some efforts to look at what we can do in a shorter term horizon, the development of a workforce, um, education, training, that's all kind of long-term. Um, so what are some shorter term things um, that maybe we could do to help support a workforce that um, was feeling exhausted and burnt out uh, before the pandemic? Um, also, when I first started uh, uh, trying to get my head around workforce issues in Vermont, um, 
I was interested to try to understand how many physicians we need, how many nurses we need. Um, and the best way to look at that is by rates. Like what, how many physicians do we have per 10,000 or 100,000 citizens? And I was surprised when I looked at that, that Vermont for years now um, has already had more physicians, a higher rate of physicians and a higher rate of nurses than most other states. And so I, I wonder if um, there'd be some effort to try to learn why other places have, of how some other places have avoided the backlogs and delays and coordinated coordination difficulties that we've had with fewer doctors and nurses. The, I you may understand. have a better answer to that, Tom, but one of the things that in Vermont, when you take a look at um, licensed uh, uh, doctors, it's a little bit deceiving because we have a lot of people who maintain licenses but don't practice full time. Mm -hmm. And so um, that could be part of the answer, but Ina may have an even better answer to that. Yeah, I think that that's, that's particularly true, uh, Kevin, given that people may come here uh, to retire. But the, the partial FTE, particularly in academic medical centers, that's true everywhere. Most clinicians who are in academic med medicine have time carved out to do research, so they're not a full FTE. So a lot of the a lot of the differences in the way people structure their time are true in other states. It's not unique to Vermont. Um, when the VA Medical Center was looking it, into its workforce difficulties, I learned about the concept of internal demand how organizations structure themselves internally, how they utilize allied health professionals, how much, what's the amount of time between a visit with a doctor, the inter-visit interval, those types of things. Um, those are all things that can be worked on right away and ease the burden on existing staff. Um, and of course, if we're not looking at any of that, we're looking at a long, horizon fix of bringing more people in to a system that's just not that may not be working terribly well for those providers so adding more um, it just may not be the answer that we're looking for the full answer that we're looking for i think it'd be good to see some things in these plans that we're trying to uh, learn from other places that are able to serve their population with fewer resources So that's all, thanks. Anything on your end, Dina, or should I proceed? I, 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 I certainly, um, I certainly ap appreciate and think that that is a, is an important line of inquiry and is, and is one also that um, I think with some of the modeling that's been um, looked at in the past, um, and in past as past products of healthcare workforce development strategic plans that we've tried to anticipate how team-based care may change the need um, for a workforce and uh, how um, different complements of providers work together to provide. And I do think that it's important to continue looking and understanding those developments. And they are that also, I think there's, you know, kind of evolution ongoing in terms of um, the practice um, of clinicians and how they meet needs. I do think, however, um, that there's, you know, critical staffing shortages today that also make it very difficult for organizations to contemplate how to reorganize care and how to work in team-based care because they can't they, they aren't able to meet the immediate needs of of patients. I mean, not of pa but they're they're not able to meet the immediate kind of demand for services today, as as we're aware. Um, so I think there that needs to be considered as well. I do think there's a very near term stability 
uh, piece that we certainly focused on with some of these recommendations and and where the legislature also uh, acted. Yeah, I I agree with you, and and I I think the the um, trying to think about what we can learn and may do differently um, can be a shorter term uh, solution when. Um, focusing on education and and recruitment can sometimes be a longer term. Okay, other board comments or questions? So I, I just got. Oh, go ahead, oh, Tom. Go ahead. No, go ahead because I, I already asked one before. I'll follow you. Okay, no worries. Um, so, Ina, just a question. Maybe can you just remind me how long the commitment is to work? Um, in Vermont after, you know, receiving a forgivable loan or as part of the loan repayment program um, in the in the new rule or in the new law? I, I believe it's consistent um, with the, the previous construct and that for each year that uh, scholarship, let's say scholarship is offered that the year that there is a year of service in turn. Okay, uh, and, great. And the way the programs function now, you can you can qualify for multiple years of scholarship, for example. Okay, thanks. And then I guess the other question is, will the I'm just wondering where who's going to be doing the an evaluation of all these multi pronged approaches to improving, increasing the pipeline and you know recruitment and retention? Is there um, a, a, some sort of plan in place in terms of you know what will the data will the data center be contributing to that? Will this come from the person who is hired to work with directly with you? Who's going to be evaluating the impacts of all of these um, new programs to see what's working, what's not? How do we tweak it? Where does that live? Well, I think the data center with time serves um, a purpose there certainly because we would. Uh, the data center will be bringing together multiple pieces from across different entities to inform the picture and our understanding of the workforce. And so with that, um, you know, those are inputs into an evaluation uh, with the data center bringing that together. But um, I don't want to oversell either and say that we've committed to a evaluation that um, you know, is a full-blown evaluation ac across all these areas. But I, but I also, as I stated, it's important to us to be able to track and understand the impact of the program. So as we've been implementing the the programs to date, which is the recruitment and retention program, we are asking for information so that we can understand um, impact. That that work, I think is something you know certainly that the person in the coordinating position uh, would be tracking would be tracking so it may seem like that's something that in the position description either for the data center or for the coordinating position might be helpful to add is some sort of background and evaluation um, just to to have at least that possibility Thank you for the update, really helpful. And it sounds like some exciting programs coming down the pike. Okay, Tom. So um, my question was the other side of the coin of uh, Jess's first question, which was uh, what if uh, somebody gets these grants for, uh, or these forgivable loans for a three year period say, and, um, and then they fall in love with somebody who's got a job uh, uh, in Montana, and so they skip out on Vermont. What 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 are the um, what are what are the penalties or what are the burdens or um, should somebody default on one of these forgivable loans? Well, so the the service obligation has to be um, has to be met in order for their the loan to be forgiven. So um, the service obligation is that. And I don't want to. I don't want to misrepresent um, the exact parameters of the program, and that's something that we could come back to you with more information on. 
um, my colleagues in the Department of Health and collaborating with AHEC on one side in terms of loan repayment, collaborating with VSAC on the other side in terms of the forgivable loans, um, operate those programs. So I don't, I don't want to misrepresent, but just at a high level, the the architecture of the forgivable loan is that, you know, it is only forgiven if the service obligation is met. I understand that. I understand that with through AEC and uh, VSAC, there's experience with loans, and so there must be some mechanisms in place that work for these institutions that I, I assume are adaptable to this situation. But you always worry about it. Um, you know, you. Um, so that was my question. Okay, any other questions or comments from the board? I just have one more, which is um, obviously the legislation and the funding uh, is going to take priority since that's, uh, you know, those initiatives need to get off the ground. But I was curious if there are things um, in the workforce strategic plan that are not included in the bill that um, you expect to continue to focus on or whether those will be paused while things get up and running from the legislation and the funding for the for the new programs. Just a little bit curious about the Venn diagram between the bill and the plan and what's not included in the bill. Yeah, that's a very good question. I do think it's a, it's a very high priority for us to recruit um, for these positions because there is so much between, you know, the plan, as you've all noted previously, is very, it's comprehensive, it's broad, there's a lot of work ac ac across a lot of areas, and I think will very much benefit benefit from uh, dedicated staff um, to implement and coordinate those activities. So um, in the near term, I do think that's where priority uh, lies. I did fail to mention, and it is included, um, it, this is included in the bill, so it's not, you know, that part of the plan that's not in the bill, but there is also work for um, uh, the board, I believe, collaborating with Department of Labor um, in the supply and demand modeling activity. Um, so uh, my apologies, that is a recommendation in the strategic plan, and I'm I'm sure you're well aware of it and um, and how the board is thinking about that work, but I did want to say that. So um, yet I, I appreciate the question, Robin, and I do think that in the near term, there are a large number of new initiatives, new programming and fund sources that are, are important for us to be in compliance with as we execute the programs. And that will be the focus in the near term. Makes sense. Thank you. OK, anything else from the board? If not, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Does any mem member of the public wish to comment on the uh, workforce uh, strategic plan? Walter. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Tom Walsh was kind of thinking along the lines that I have that I was, so I won't be I won't rehash that, but I did have one question, uh, more of a generic type question. One of the most common denominators in all the workforce development plans was eligible. Why does everyone have to be eligible? Kind of like you're starting a class society of who's eligible and who isn't, but that was just my question. <clears throat> I see that as a problem right away from someone who has had to be eligible before in other guises. Uh, Walter, I think some of some of that, you know, is is in how I summarized the work and that and the description of the eligible uh, types is is certainly included within the legislation so that it's describing the the different types. I think we, you know, uh, do intend that certain funds are um, are available for the health and human services sector in particular, and 
need to put some parameters around those funds. I think there, otherwise we would risk. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Chair Moen. You, sh I, I think you usually like to direct the answers to the questions. No, that's fine, Ina. I would have directed it to you anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 not I'm losing I'm losing my edge in the um uh, in the conduct for the board meetings. Um. Uh. So so you know there do there does need to be some parameters around the fund. There are, um you know I think um there are some uh in the system who might not be <laughs> licensed as a healthcare provider, who may view their services as healthcare, for instance, that may not be a health or human service. And we certainly would want to you know, be able to understand that the dollars are, are being directed to um, uh, legitimate health and human services provider types as established in the legislation. Walter, I hear a cough, are you okay? I hope so. I need CPR. I'm in the right place, right? Yeah, I don't know how we would do that, but <laughs> <laughs> we'd have to Someone check on your eligibility, oh, Walter. There are limitations to telemedicine for sure. <laughs> Someone would call 911, right? Yeah, we would call 911. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I don't know if we would have your address to give them. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. send a doctor. Send a doctor over, Kevin. Okay. <laughs> Is there other public comment? Hearing none, Ina, I want to thank you for the update. Um, this is something that uh, um, is so so important this work and uh, we appreciate uh, being ke kept up to speed and we understand that uh, you'll update us on we'll a, update us a, regular on a basis. Regular basis. Yes, and hopefully, yes, and uh, hopefully uh, getting feedback, getting from, feedback someone. from someone. <laughs> my, my hope is that future updates um, will be led by perhaps the healthcare workforce coordinator, um, certainly with my with my supporting role. But um, certainly like to introduce you to another person as soon as we're able. We look forward to that. So thank you very much. So next we're going to uh, turn to um, the vital fiscal year 23 budget. And I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Jessica Mendizabo. Jess. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, just a second. So um, thank you again. Um, uh, for the record, my name is Jessica Mendisable, and I am a director of data management at the Green Mountain Care Board. Today, I will provide an overview of the board's oversight authority related to Vermont Information Technology Leaders, or VITAL which is Vermont's designated sole health information exchange network. I will summarize VITAL's fiscal year 2023 budget submission, which was presented to the board on June 8th, and I will provide a staff recommendation for the board's consideration. So as part of its oversight and policy making activities related to health information technology and health information exchange, the board is required to review and approve VITALS budget annually. This authority was granted to the board in 2015 and was first exercised in 2016. The board's oversight is intended to provide strategic guidance and policy parameters. This is a summary slide of VITAL's FY23 budget submission. All the detailed documentation can be found on the Green Mountain Care Board website. VITAL's revenue includes state funding through their contract with the Department of Vermont Health Access, as well as the Department of Health. The FY23 revenue reflects project work that's shifting into FY23 from previous years. There's also non-state funding, and um, this reflects a decrease uh, in FY23 of some program fees and, um, and some other non-state contracts. VITAL's major expense categories are highlighted here and reflect additional staff positions as well as some contractor work to support shorter-term projects. 
and we see a slight increase in software expenses to support operations. There's also a built-in contingency of $100,000. So the budget review criteria, which I did review very briefly prior to Vital's presentation, is here again um, for your reference. Um, the criteria was established in the budget guidance and approved by the board in April of um, 2021. The guidance includes four principles for use in reviewing Vital's budget, which are listed here, and I will review these in more detail along with a staff assessment in the following slides. The first review criteria is transparency. Transparency is measured by compliance with the budget guidance and overall transparency of the budget process. And staff find that VITAL has complied with the budget guidance. Um, the budget guidance was submitted in a timely manner, including all requested components. VITAL also responded to board member written questions about the budget in a timely manner and actually addressed those uh, answers in their presentation to the board. The budget narrative and all the financial documentation, as well as the most recent audited financial statements and the IRS form 990 are posted to the Green Mountain Care Board website. We have a link there for you. The second review criteria is that we have public and stakeholder input. So, um, Staff have found that VITAL presented at the June 8th board meeting, as we've said, and responded to questions from board members and the public at that time. In addition, we did hold a special public comment period from June 8th to Friday, June 17th, and we did not receive any written comments during that period. The third review criteria is that the budget align with the Health Information Exchange strategic plan goals. The updated plan was approved by the by the board in November of 2021, and that's also available on our website. The criteria specifies that the board will not direct the technical details of VITALS work or the details of VITALS contractual relationship with the state. Staff find that the budgeted activities will advance the goals of the 2021 update to the HIE plan, and those are to create one health record for every person, to improve healthcare operations, and to use the data to enable investment and policy decisions. Staff also find that the budgeted activities will advance the goals of the HIE plan by providing the following services, which are foundational services, exchange services, and end user services. These categories reflect the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology Framework, which the state's HIE plan relies on. The budget submission includes a table, which is referenced here, um, which categorizes vital revenue sources and major projects by service category. The fourth review criteria is alignment with the vital and DIVA process. And so, um, our review has to be structured in, and timed in order to assist VITAL and DIVA as they negotiate timely effective agreements each year. Staff have worked with DIVA and VITAL to prepare the timeline for this year's review to ensure that we are in compliance and we do not conflict with the federal contracting requirements for the agreements. In addition, staff will ensure that written decisions resulting from this budget review are sufficiently clear. So staff recommend approving the vital FY 2023 budget as presented with the following conditions. In addition to reporting requirements outlined in the budget guidance, quarterly reporting should include updates on vitals work to design a future financial model that would diversify revenue sources. Vitals strategic planning process and progress. Continued work on integration of claims and clinical data in the VHI and continued work on consent, including patient education. The second condition is that VITAL will comply with mid-year budget update requirements as described in the board's annual budget guidance. So um, that is my recommendation. Are there any questions from the board on VITAL's budget or the recommendation? Do any board members have any questions? 
Okay, maybe you could reverse to the uh, uh, motion language. I don't have a um, motion prepared. Uh, Robin, are you prepared? Uh, yes. Uh, can you? Although, actually, I'll just pull up the staff. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'll I'll reshare. No, it's okay. I have it up. Um, so I would move that we approve Vital's uh, fiscal year 23 budget uh, with two conditions um, that in addition to the reporting requirements outlined in the budget guidance, quarterly reporting should continue to include updates on Vital's work to design a future financial model that would diversify revenue sources, Vital strategic planning process in progress, continued work on integration of claims and clinical data in the VHI and continued work on consent, including patient education. So that's one condition. The second condition would be to comply with mid-year budget update requirements as described in the budget guidance. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, before I open it up to public comment, is there any discussion from the board? Hearing none, I'm going to open um, the discussion on Vitals 23 budget for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment at this time? Hearing none, I'll ask one more time if any board member has any further discussion. And I, here I, I just want to, I oh, just, want to quick, just quickly add that over the last two or three years, I think Vital has done a very good job and and under some stress, uh, you know, moving from opt in to opt out went smoothly. Um, the role that Vital played in the pandemic in terms of the lab reports and all that that was wasn't on their screen, you know, originally uh, went very well. And so it's just fun to be in the public sector and see an organization that's getting its job done quietly um, and 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 thoroughly. They've come a long way and it was very refreshing also to see the regional news. So kudos to uh, Beth and the team at uh, um, Vital. But I do see Ham Davis has some public comment now. <laughs> Ham. Or maybe his hand is up for no reason. Ham, did you wish to offer public comment? Uh, yes, I have it, Kevin. I just was muted. I'm sorry. Um, and I'm not sure this is the right place, but uh, what, what I've sort of looked for consistently, especially uh, between Vital and um, the uh, and um, and One Care Vermont and the uh, and and the whole system and the AHS, AHS system is whether or not we can start to see some numbers that really make sense. In terms of of uh, of of, of uh, uh, quality systems in the, the quality measures in the system, if we look at member back when uh, when all those consultants came in on October 27th of last fall, um, the the uh, um, there was a lot of stuff in there. The PQI that showed very great differences in uh, in quality between uh, one hospital and another hospital service area. Um, there were um, there were uh, information brought forth that a uh, certain amount of some of the care in the system is not needed, et cetera, et cetera. One of the quest things I think that is most important in Vermont, and I've never seen, and, I, and I, I, I've heard that it exists, but I've never seen it. I don't know whether it's in vital or where it is, but, and that is the question of revision surgery. Okay. So that if, so that in, if you get a, if you get a, an operation in Mass General, um, and it doesn't go well, then you may need to go back to a different doctor in Mass General. But if you if you have a if you're in a especially in a smaller hospital, if in Vermont, if you have a bad result from a surgery, you're not going to go back to the same hospital. It may be the same doctor. You're going to go to a different hospital, usually one either in Burlington, in Hanover, in Boston, or in some other place. Is there any way we can get the data, actual data, on revision surgery in Vermont? Because I think that's one of our biggest expenses is, is stuff like, is, is complicated surgery. So I'd agree that's one of the biggest expenses. And I did see that 
Beth, you popped up on the screen. Were you um, going to answer this question or? I, I I just wanted to be ready to answer any questions that came up out of public comment. So happy happy to try if you would like me to, but sure. not specific to this one. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a great question. And from Vital's perspective, like we are not doing the analytics on the data at this point where we really have been focused is on getting the data and getting good quality data that can be used by our partners to do this type of analysis and analytics. And we do work closely with the ACO, um, Department of Health, um, the Blueprint programs to, to make that data available for them to do the work and the analysis. So it's not something that we specifically have looked at because it's not really within our kind of mission for our work at this point. So I, I'm not sure um, if VPQH is on or not, but they're usually here. Do you know if they're doing some work in this area? Uh, Kevin. Oh, there we go, Kathy. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Um, <laughs> if, uh, this is Kathy Fulton from the Executive Director at the Vermont Program for Quality and Healthcare. And um, to answer Han's question, um, I, I think that's, um, certainly on the horizon for our organization, um, the, the very thrilling news of the regional collaboration uh, takes us that many steps closer to making that type of analysis um, a more routine and um, hopefully productive uh, you know, process that could benefit everyone from being able to see you know, not just the volume and utilization, but the quality outcomes and you know, where being able to identify where opportunities for improvement exist. So, um, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm thrilled to see uh, the collaboration that's coming. That, that's been an item that's been on my whiteboard for a while now. So um, I think the answer to your question, Ham, is um, yes, hopefully sooner than later. Okay. Is there any further board discussion before we vote? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the vital 23 budget was passed unanimously. So I do see that we're ahead of the uh, 230 meeting. I wonder if it might make sense to adjust the agenda and move um, the ACO guidance up next because we had, uh, Susan, I think we promised Commissioner Haas that it would be 230, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And um, I would just, I don't know how long that agenda item is going to take and I don't see them on the line yet. We did say 2.30, I just didn't know if it would. Well, if it appears that it's going extremely long, I'll figure out a way to okay. uh, have okay. an intermission to the ACO discussion. So at this point, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Marissa Melamed. Marissa. Hi, thank you, Chair Mullen, members of the board. Um, I'm not sure we'll be able to get through the whole thing in um, 15 minutes, but maybe the, the presentation and um, but we can we can manage that, no problem. Um, I'm going to go ahead and present the slide. Okay, well, again, good afternoon. My name is Marissa Melamed, Associate Director for Health Systems Policy. Uh, this is part three of the board's review of the FY23 ACO budget guidance and certification form. Um, today on the agenda, um, we did receive some uh, public comments, so we'll start with that. Um, there are a couple of updates to the two guidances that were reviewed uh, last week, so I will go through those. Um, there is some time for questions and public comment, and then uh, there's some suggested motion language and a potential vote uh, if you're ready to do that. And the most recent uh, version of the two guidances are posted with today's board meeting materials, um, so those are clean copies of the uh, the guidance, sort of the final draft um, that we're discussing today. So for a summary of the comments that we received, we received two public comments. They were both on the Medicare only ACO guidance that was 
presented originally on June 8th. Um, we've provided a summary here. The board has received those comments. They're also posted on the website. Um, they um, included concerns about uh, beneficiary impact. Um, and uh, just, just to note there, as we've described in the staff analysis um, and in, in, this, in some remarks um, as part of this guidance, uh, being attributed to an ACO that's in a, a CMS or a Medicare uh, program, the, the REACH model, which was previously called the uh, direct contracting model, um, that does not change or limit the beneficiary's traditional Medicare benefits access to Medicare providers or costs. So they are still in a traditional Medicare program. Um, the, the REACH and the, the, or the previous DC model are agreements between providers um, and the, the REACH ACO or direct contracting entity. Um, and it does not change the beneficiaries um, uh, benefits or enrollment in traditional Medicare only. Um, the, the other was around concerns about private companies' involvement in Medicare. Um, and so under the statute and rule, the board's authority is to review and approve or modify an ACO's proposed budget, and the board must work with the parameters of the Medicare programs set by CMS. Um, the guidance, which is what you're approving today, um, does cover elements of the budget review that are in 18 BSA 9382B, um, but it doesn't cover other statutory requirements. So we do look at, at all statutory requirements when we do the review, um, but we're just focused on the guidance today. So notes on the FY23 Medicare only guidance or updates since the original presentation. There was some discussion around the health equity question. Uh, and it sounds like uh, the, the consensus um, was to keep that question broad and just list um, how is the ACO addressing health equity concerns um, under the assumption that that is going to include uh, uh, racial disparities within the health equity concerns. Um, so we did update that question to uh, respond to, to that discussion. Um, and we aligned it with the other guidance, with the certified ACO guidance as well. So this is one change that was made and the new question is in uh, blue below. That's the only change to the Medicare only guidance since the original presentation. Um, for the FY23 certified ACO budget guidance, there are a couple of updates. Um, one was some suggestions by board member Holmes to edit the total cost of care accountability strategy by, uh, by HSA questions. And the edits to that question are in blue. And it was to add um, the term avoidable utilization um, to to make this question a little bit more specific to try to get a more specific answer. Um, there's also the addition of that last sentence there to cite specific examples and where possible quantify the ACO's direct impact on reducing avoidable utilization and or low value care and low to lowering total cost of care in specific HSAs. I also actually combined, there was an A, B and C here um, in looking at it again, A and B were pretty uh, similar. It was the first question there under A. And so I just, I put the question all together into one sub bullet because sometimes when the ACO answers, they divide out each sub bullet. And I thought this would give a more concise answer. So that is the change there. And again, that's based on conversation that was had at previous meeting. And then this is the companion question that's in the Medicare only guidance around health equity. So we aligned the questions here and kept um, the, the question to be broad um, around social determinant um, data. We made one edit here as well based on uh, some feedback and internal discussion. Again, similar to the HSA total cost of care accountability question, this was just to be really specific that we want the ACO to an answer with some examples. So we added and provide a couple of examples of how it has improved quality to the question around evaluation of the quality improvement program. 
Finally, in part two of the certified ACO budget guidance around setting targets and benchmarks, um, we propose to you two targets for the FY23 certified ACO guidance, one around um, the VBIF or other pre-funded clinical quality incentive programs, um, one around the commercial benchmark trend rates, which are consistent with either um, decisions the board had made uh, previously or um, uh, conditions that are generally in the order that we want to um, make sure that the ACO is considering when they create their budget. Um, we had some discussion around setting the fixed perspective payment um, target. Um, and we did decide after discussion, after that discussion to add a third um, budget target for the guidance. Um, and it's, it's number three there in bold, and it reads, the ACO shall endeavor to meet or exceed the target proposed by the ACO and approved or modified by GMCB staff in accordance with One Care Vermont's FY22 budget order condition 3A for the portion of the FY23 commercial payer contract revenue in the form of fixed perspective payments. So just a couple of remarks around this. Um, so again, setting targets or benchmarks in the guidance is something that we haven't uh, done before that we've been working towards doing to give um, the ACO more specific guidance when they're actually creating their budget around what we want to see in the budget. So they can bring that to their board of managers when they're putting their budget together, um, as opposed to you know, conditions that we impose on the, on the ACO after the fact under the review. Um, now the conditions in the budget order um, if I'm, if I understand correctly and, and legal, well, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but are, are sort of more binding in terms of enforcement. Guidance is guidance. We're saying this is what we um, want to see, um, and then the the actual sort of order and the enforcement comes in the in the budget order. Um, so, uh, given that, we did decide it makes sense to put in that we want to see. Um, you know, a target uh, around fixed perspective payments in the guidance. So we've added that in. Um, the, um, the reason why we didn't put a specific target in here is because um, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of semantics. We've required some additional reporting from them around the methodology um, and the reasons, um, or yeah, the methodology around how those targets were set. Um, and the staff wants to see that reporting before we say, um, this is a target. That being said, um, if the board wants to put the target in of, of 23.9% that, that One Care has proposed, um, you can do so. Um, we just were interested in waiting to see that reporting that's coming in. But the way this is written um, and the way that the FY22 budget order is written, um, we are still able to impose that target or, or you know, set it as, as something that we want the uh, ACO to strive to meet and then explain to us why they um, did or did not meet it when they turn in the, um, their budget submission uh, in October. Um, so hopefully that helps clarify. What I, what I don't think was clear last week is that we, had already, we already had language in the budget order um, around uh, FPP target. Um, this just more clearly brings it forward to the guidance. Um, which I think is, is helpful uh, for the board and for the ACO to have when they are, are creating their budget. Um, so it looks, I may have already said what I had on this slide, um, but that reporting that I'm talking about that's due in July, um, it requires more transparency around the calculation um, of, the, of the baseline and targets. And it also requires a little bit more of a detailed report around reconciled and unreconciled uh, FPP, which the original report doesn't include. And then this is the second point there is the language that's in the budget order already um, around um, specifying the target. So um, depending on how much discussion or questions um, that does bring me to the end of the presentation, uh, Russ with our legal team put together the suggested motions. There would be two motions, one for the Medicare only guidance um, and one for the certified ACO guidance, which includes language around the targets. 
um, you'll see that there's some bracketed phrases in there, which you would include if you have any additional uh, changes that you want to make today um, that I have not spoken about that the, you know, the board um, decides on. So I will leave it um, at that. Uh, Chair Mullen, you can decide how you want to proceed. I think you're still on mute. Trying to be efficient with time and I'm blowing it. Okay, so uh, board members, do you have any questions? Hearing none, is there any member of the public who wishes to offer no. public comment? Oh, Tom. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I I do have a question. I just want to get this and this um, kind of uh, so solid in my in my understanding here that um, I think that and I, and I've I've said this before, but I I'll repeat it repeat it briefly now is that the commercial FPP is a big deal, um, and uh, when uh, after five years of the all pair model effort. You know, we're only at we're still at 98% commercial payment um, f through fee for service and 2% or less uh, through fixed prospective payments. And you have the ACO saying, and this is a quote: "The pivotal first step in managing overall healthcare cost growth is to transition the health system from one rewarded by volume to one that rewards cost-effective and high-quality care." So, in my mind. Um, the uh, the one care is kind of an intermediary, a very important intermediary, and um, but we're kind of losing ground. Um, if if you look at their 22 budget order, um, <clears throat> the external process, including fee for service, increased by 91 million dollars, 22 over 21, which is an 11.6 percent increase, and in the fixed prospective payments uh, only increased by 38.6 million dollars. So uh, there's, to me, in my mind, there is a distinct contrast between the statements of the value of fixed prospective payments um, to healthcare reform and what we see in reality on the ground after a number of years. So um, for me, uh, the ACO presented a number for 2023 for commercial at 23.9%. And I just want to kind of make sense that 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 is what this language language is establishing. That we're not going to go back. Um, um, I mean, I worry about this language about the staff review that just becomes another platform to people argue over FPP and defining it, et cetera, et cetera. When when the um, underlying foundational structure of FPP is not being supported. Um, so uh, so that's my simple. My concern is a macro foundational concern that we aren't focused enough on pushing commercial FPP. Um, that that's my concern, and I just want to know when I read percentage of payments in the form of FPP set in accordance with the FY22 One Care Vermont budget order, and in that budget order, commercials at 23.9. So is that is that my what I can take home, take to the bank? So the recommendation that we have put forth here as staff, I'm going to go back to the actual recommendation, um, does not set, does not establish the 23.9% as the target. It says that um, the target will be um, the target that's proposed by the ACO and approved or modified by GMCB staff. So the 23.9% the, the is the proposed target by the ACO. Um, they've presented that several times. The staff has not done the, has not completed our review in order to approve and modify. So um, I think that you, as the board, if you wanted to, um, you know, uh, the target is set is set by the ACO. I think um, if if you wanted to um, in, endorse that, or if the board wanted to endorse that, you could. Um, the staff wasn't ready to endorse that target um, because, frankly, I think it's um, quite aspirational, which which might be fine for a target. But we were looking for a, a little to to complete that reporting to see if we could understand what we if 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 there's a different number that might be the right number. 
Um, but that being said, if the board wants to add um, a specific target at this time, you can. Um, what this language does, it says that, that there will be a target that's endorsed. Um, we're just waiting for some additional reporting. Well, I worry, I, I, I do worry as much as I respect our staff um, and the ACO staff, we're very, very talented people. I do worry that this conversation can go on and on and on and on. And in the meantime, uh, time, the clock is ticking. We can see that we're only at 2% FPP, you know, in, on the private side now. Um, we've kind of nearing maxed out on Medicaid and maxed out on Medicare in terms of attribution there. You know, we are far down the road and that, that uh, the commercial payer is the biggest payer across all of them. And uh, we, don't have a, we don't have a target yet. I, for me personally, I'd be willing to say I'm going with the 23.9% for 2023 because that would be a huge step forward um, if 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 that reality could could unfold, if 23.9 percent of commercial payments were uh, via FPP unreconciled, um, I know that's not going to happen. The reality, but but I'd rather have a target there, where the system is failing against that target, um, and so there's uh, an ability to kind of push the target more aggressively, as opposed to having an ongoing discussion about what comprises a target when if we even got anywhere near 23.9%, it would be a home run. So that's, 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 that's where I'm at. Tom, as I try to figure out uh, whether I should go and uh, put an intermission here and go to Commissioner Haas, do you have alternative motions that you're going to make or? Well, I'm just not quite sure this is the right venue. I, I, I mean, if I were to make an alternative motion, I would change the word endeavor to use best efforts to kind of elevate it a little bit more. And I think I might get rid of the language that has our staff review the, the methodology because that to me creates a platform for people to keep arguing over the number. And I would just, you know, think it might be beneficial to get rid of the platform, you know, given um, given the uh, where we stand with FPP and, and uh, the commercial payer. So if I offer anything, it would be two things. Change endeavor to uh, best efforts, um, which I think is a little bit stronger language. I, I know that the ACO can't wave a magic wand and make 23.9% happen. Um, and then I am I guess I'm still insecure as to what the staff review is going to lead to. And if it's just going to be something that sucks up a lot of time and we already have a good solid number you know, um, in the 22 board order at 23.9, I'd go with the 23.9 um, and just and just move on as fast as we can. Okay, I think we're close to um, at least finalizing uh, what uh, might be the motion. So I'm going to continue with this just for a few more minutes and see where we go. And so I'm going to open it up for public comment on the ACO guidance. Is there any member of the public who wishes to offer guidance at this time? Does any member of the public wish to offer comment at this time? Pam Davis. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I think this uh, uh, Tom Pelham has really made this point over and over again, and I think it's critical. I think it's critical to do that. Um, and I agree with him that that what's really the real risk here in a certain sense, in a bureaucratic sense, is that we just keep babbling about something and never nothing ever really happens. Um, one of the things I would ask is that I think it's just set up as a proposition. I think that the attention to the ACO to make this happen is completely misplaced. The ACO has no power whatsoever to compel any um, payer, whether it's a private payer, a government payer, any payer, other payer, any kind of payer, to participate in a fixed price contract, that has to be it has to be a decision by it has to be a decision by the payer to want to do that. And it, on the other side, you have to have in, a, a decision by individual hospitals to agree to live under a fixed price contract. So I would just say that the 
that that that, that, that this chase, chase all around is just not going to get anywhere. If I've got another minute, can I make another point, Kevin, or, should, or do you want to stop? As long as it's about the ACO guidance. Yeah. Um, the, yes. Uh, well, uh, okay. I, I'm not sure about that. It's, it's generally about it. Yes. Here is here it is. Uh, if the single most important piece of data about what's actually happened is the Dartmouth Health Atlas, every policy person that I know and the serious per person in the policy biz agrees with that, rock solid. And what that what that shows is that the is that the UBM Health Network, because mainly because it's an academic medical center with a whole different financing structure for its physicians, okay is very, very, very low. And you've got very high cost per capita in the hospital service areas for other for the other hospitals. I mean way, way, way more. Okay. And so if you look at if you just look at the if you look at what the percentages are, it's a Tom's point, Tom Pelham's point. If you look at that, the UVM health net just the UVM MC itself is half of all the care in Vermont. Half. OK, and it has very low. It's the lowest cost per capita in the service area. And that that's also um, that's also backed up by the BR, the Berkeley Research Group PQI data that you've got in October. So I would just say um, in this, it, it, to get in to get in a to get the kind of participation that Tom Pelham wants is going to depend not on you on ACE on the ACO at all. It's going to depend on the, the determination of Blue Cross in real life, okay, to say that they want that kind of a contract. I would just guarantee you that if Blue Cross asked you, uh, One Care Vermont to design a fixed price contract, One Care would do it. Why wouldn't they? Okay. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Walter. Thanks, Kevin. Just a point. Uh, I'm, I agree with Tom Pelham's points and Ham's point as well. I just wanted to say that Blue Cross, et cetera, are not payers. They just are middle people who disperse it. We are the payers. So it's almost like asking us to be in a contract. OK, is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Is a board member prepared to make a motion at this time? I'll I'll go ahead and make a motion unless Tom Pelham you'd like to, but before that, I just want to comment on Tom and Marissa's comments. So, regardless of what we change in the in the guidance, it does not change the budget order. And the budget order has the staff looking at the targets and uh, approving or modifying. So taking that language out of here doesn't change the process that we that we established in our budget order last whenever it was, December or January. So I just want to make that clear um, because this is the guidance. It's not the budget order. So. I, where I am with this is I like the addition of adding the third uh, target. Um, I, however, would prefer to see what comes out of the staff analysis before picking a number because my recollection of the reporting that we've gotten to date is that I didn't feel comfortable that those numbers were real. And while I don't disagree that setting a target you can choose to be aggressive. I would like to know that it's somewhere within the realm of reality uh, and not just throwing a dart on a dart dartboard. So just where I personally am is I, I'm fine with changing Endeavor to use best efforts. I agree that is a little bit stronger. I think that's a good change. So um, I would, uh, that's that's where I'm at in terms of uh, sort of the discussion around the FPP target. So I can go ahead and make a motion unless Tom wants to make a motion um, or if other people want to comment. I don't know how you want to handle it, Kevin. 
Tom, did you wish to make a motion? No, I mean, if 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 Robin wants to make make a motion with best efforts in it, um, um, I, that's that would get me halfway. I know that I'm not going to get all the way there. So um, my feeling here is that, you know, at least at least we have systematically worked in the 2021 budget order to get uh, uh, the ACO to kind of commit to giving us targets. They gave us targets, and when we uh, encased them in the 2022 budget order, um, and I just don't, you know, I worry that that our staff language will will end up quibbling with the ACO over methodology, and months and months and months will go by. But um, I'm not going to be on the board in months and months from now. So, uh, uh, but I I do want to at every point possible um, make this a serious. Concern because it is fundamentally a serious concern that I sometimes wonder what were the rate increases that were being proposed now by the carriers at 12 and a half percent and 16 percent look like if we if 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 Brumstead who was a willing partner had a willing partner at Blue Cross Blue Shield and they had implemented fixed prospective payments mm -hmm. two years ago I think we'd be in a different place so. Um, I'll let Rotworth make the motion and um, uh, hoping she puts best efforts in and at least it's something. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tom. Hey, Marissa, did you have something to add? I did, yes, if I may. Thank you. I just wanted to offer one more comment that might help if any board members are still not sure. I think there's two ways to think about it. You could set a target um, an aspirational target, um, like like Robin said, um, or to Ham's point, you could set anything you want. You could set it at 50% or over 50%, which is, you know, where Medicaid is at, or Medicare if you include um, their, their AIPVP. Um, or you could set a target or or wait to set a target that's more realistic, um, and that's that's I think that's kind of the decision. Um, and I think the the target that they set is kind of somewhere somewhere in the middle. So I think um, you could, you know, the board could the board could set an aspirational target or you could leave the language as it is um, and uh, allow staff to sort of finish our more our technical review. Or um, I think I think um, you know accepting that the target that's already been proposed is kind of something in the middle of that. So um, in case that helps to think of it those two ways, um, that's my comment. Okay, Robin, are you prepared to proceed? I am. So first I'll move that uh, the board adopt the fiscal year 23 budget guidance and reporting requirements for Medicare only non-certified ACO as presented by the board's staff. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Robin. I move that the board adopt the fiscal year budget guidance and reporting requirements for Vermont certified ACOs as presented by the GMCB staff today, uh, specifically including the fiscal year proposed budget targets for minimum funding of BBIS commercial benchmark trend rate consistent with ACO attributed population and GMCB approved rate filings and uh, setting a percentage of payments in the form of FPP set in accordance with the fiscal year 22 budget order with the change that the word endeavor um, be struck and use best efforts be included in lieu of endeavor. A second. Okay, is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Marissa. And next, we're going to turn to an update from the Department of Mental Health. And we're going to hear from Commissioner Emily Haas. Commissioner, whenever you're ready. And if we could take down the other screen, perfect. Welcome, Commissioner. Thank you. Thanks for having me. 
Uh, today, I'm also joined by uh, Deputy Commissioner Allison Crump, um, Samantha Sweet, who is our Mental Health Services Director, and then our Interim Policy Director, Nicole D'Estazio. Um, so I'll just do a brief um, overview of current priorities for DMH. Um, we'll also highlight some initiatives that have gone um, into action over the last several months. Um, and then uh, highlight some gaps that we've identified in the system and we can go from there. Does that sound like a good plan? It sounds great. Okay. Um, so Nicole, if you don't mind um, moving us to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so for folks who, who don't know or haven't seen the department's vision 2030, um, this came out of some work that occurred right before the pandemic, uh, where we engaged um, stakeholders across the state um, in several um, town hall style meetings uh, to really look at our system of care and develop a vision, a 10 year vision for 2030. Uh, and so that's to advance the, and so Allison and I both came into these positions about a year ago, and we continue the work around Vision 2030 with the department. So advancing the goals and, or and objectives of Vision 2030 for a coordinated, holistic, and integrated system of care for Vermont. Um, we are looking to expand access to community-based services, enhancing intervention and discharge planning services to support uh, Vermonters in crisis. We're committed to workforce development and payment parity and completing our mental health integration work. Highlighting in action area number four, um, I'll mention the implementation of mobile crisis. Um, DMH has testified um, a couple of times around the Rutland uh, mobile response stabilization pilot that has been um, operating for about the last year, maybe 10 months um, out of the Rutland area. And we've seen some success um, with that pilot program and we'll be looking to um, continue that um, as well as, as expanding that into four other, um, four other areas of the state. We're also looking to align um, our provider incentives uh, so DMH has included performance measures in the provider agreements with our designated agencies to incentivize providers to move individuals through the system of care. So when somebody is no longer meeting hospital level of care, that there um, is action towards discharge. Um, also taking a look at where crisis assessments are occurring. Um, with a primary focus on those occurring in our community setting versus an emergency department setting. And then also a follow up after a hospitalization stay um, for mental illness, and that's both for youth and adults. Okay, this is Samantha. I have the next slide. and. My apologies about my voice. I've been fighting a cold for a couple weeks now, so let me know if you can't hear me. Telepsychiatry. So DMH was able to secure $100,000 for telepsychiatry services with the intention to use these funds for critical access hospitals that do not currently have psychiatry in their emergency room. Uh, quickly after securing the funds at DMH, we learned that DPQ was awarded $1 million through Senator Leahy's office to establish a Vermont emergency telepsychiatry network. BPQ partnered with DMH and Vaz to create a survey to go out to all uh, hospital emergency rooms to learn more about what equipment they have, what are their needs, who currently has psychiatry available in the emergency room, along with several other important questions. The survey was completed about two weeks ago and DMH uh, is meeting later this week with DPQ to review the results of that survey. And our intention is that, or our hope is that the survey will be able to help guide us in the development that needs to happen, the allocation of the resources and to establish a process 
Our goal is, and I think I said this at the beginning, but I just want to say this again, our goal is to make sure that everybody in emergency rooms has access to mental health services and specialty, just like any other uh, healthcare crisis that goes to the emergency room. So our goal is to get the services in the emergency room very quickly, have that available for consultation or for medication, um, prescribing, whatever the need might be. To move over to 9A8, so currently Vermont is providing statewide coverage 24-7 to the Crisis Prevention Lifeline. Currently the centers, we have two centers in Vermont and they are providing uh, follow-up mental health support to anyone that has a history of suicidal ideation or anybody that has expressed any current suicidal ideation or um, has any risk factors. And as I'm sure you have heard in the media, effective uh, in about a month, so July 16th, uh, the 10-digit suicide prevention number will be a three-digit number, 988. And as you will see on this slide, there will continue to be free and confidential tech support by texting VT to 741741. Um, so we are excited about 988, and there's a lot of work going into that currently to make sure that we are ready for July 16th. I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about suicide prevention. So again, I'm Allison Kromp. I'm the deputy commissioner. And when we look at suicide prevention and why it's important, one, I'll show you on the next slide some statistics, but also when we see the list of folks um, waiting for emergency departments, waiting in emergency departments for placement. Can I eat the whole thing even if I'm not going to eat it all? Um, Pam, if you could mute yourself, I believe that was you. <laughs> No problem, Ham. I'm hungry too. Um, <laughs> so we get the list of folks waiting in emergency departments, and most days the majority of folks, um, particularly with youth, are there for suicidal ideation. Um, that tends to be, and it's been increasing over time, it's been increasing with youth before the pandemic, um, and it's really been exacerbated by the pandemic. So we're we're grateful that there's some additional funding uh, coming our way. Once the big bill was signed, that came with a package of suicide prevention uh, funding. So we've only had a very small piece historically. We're, we've grown that this coming year, and there's a lot of initiatives to go with that. So uh, you may have heard about zero suicide. That's a public health approach. It has pieces to it that include training providers how to treat suicidality. It includes educating schools and includes assisting emergency departments if they want to screen it it's a very large umbrella so some of the funding will go towards expanding zero suicide in the state some of the funding is to support 988 which samantha just spoke to also we look at where are our, our most vulnerable vermonters and for a period of time older vermonters were dying at a higher rate um, in vermont than other states and so we do have a program that goes out to homes to serve um, older Vermonters with mental health needs. And we're looking to expand that with some additional funding. And lastly, that funding is going to go towards a director of suicide prevention for the state of Vermont. Um, up until now, we haven't had any position focused on suicide and the funding's getting larger. There's a lot of federal opportunities and we want to be able to prioritize um, going for those and then you having somebody who can implement. The other two pieces you should be aware of, there's a larger effort with the, we received a CDC suicide prevention grant in 2020. And we, I say we, but it's technically the Department of Health and we're partnering with them. And it's been a really great opportunity to look at how do we maximize syndromic surveillance? How do we dig into some of their population health expertise and work together? And that's a, a five-year grant um, that the goal is to reduce suicide both um, mortality and morbidity by 10% um, by 2025. And lastly, I'm going to name the governor's challenge. Governor Scott um, requested that we sign on as a state to the na national effort called the governor's challenge to reduce suicide deaths for service members, veterans, and their families. 
Vermont has a very large National Guard population, and when you include their family members and you include veterans and other service members, this is a very big target population for which has a higher increased um, risk for suicide. So we're excited about that. We signed on just about a month ago um, and have the governor's office support. And then this is the staggering data that will tell you why this is so important. We've had an issue in Vermont for a long time. We've been higher than the national average for over a decade. But last year, in 2021, we lost 142 Vermonters to suicide, which is intensely and notably higher than we have in the past. Um, so we're really feeling an, an imminent need to address this issue. Okay, I think it comes back to me. Um, so another uh, area, action area eight, is our commitment to workforce development um, and payment parity. I'm sure that you've heard, um, it's well known, the workforce uh, shortage and crisis that Vermont is experiencing across our healthcare system. Um, so I'll focus this specifically around the designated agencies and special service special, special service agencies, uh, workforce recruitment and retention. Um, so around uh, December, DMH was able to um, give out uh, about $2 million for workforce retention that went directly to the designated agency system. Uh, we're also uh, leading a workforce development subcommittee um, and beginning to do some work to develop a peer support credentialing program um, in order to expand the available workforce uh, to respond to mental health needs. Um, and then I think folks are probably aware there was an 8% increase allotted to the designated agency SSA system for July 1st. Um, and part of that is obviously to support uh, payment parity and retention. I'll highlight um, also the peer workforce development initiative, um, which is a, a $30,000 grant um, to support the initial stages of a peer support credentialing program. Um, and so we'll be holding or hosting a, a series of stakeholder working sessions to develop recommendations uh, to present for access to peer support services. Um, the Department of Mental Health is, is fully committed to having a um, peer support um, initiative and credentialing process to provide those uh, needed supports for uh, Vermonters in need. Here's a graph to highlight some of the vacancy challenges specific to the designated agency and SSAs. Um, so as you see around December, um, they reached the highest level of vacancies at around 1,027, um, which is substantial. Um, as we moved through the winter months into the spring and some additional um, money and raises were given to those staff, we, stopped, we saw their vacancy rate start to decrease. We'll be getting some updated data around their vacancy rates in the coming um, weeks, uh, but we're hopeful that folks are continuing to uh, be able to hire permanent staff. And uh, we'll, we'll keep working to uh, support those agencies and, and moving forward. Other things I'll highlight, this is around um, potential uh, integration. Um, so we have an initiative with the uh, secretary's office to expand hub and spoke. Our first, um, in, our first focus of that is um, increasing access to mental health services at the hubs. Um, and so being able to have those providers um, serve folks in a more comprehensive and integrated way. Additionally, DMH in collaboration with um, Vermont Care Partners and the National uh, Council are working uh, through a policy academy around um, CCBHCs or Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics. Uh, those are very similar to uh, an FQHC. Um, we're in the early stages of that project right now. Um, there are uh, expansion grants available that the designated agencies have applied for. Um, I think nine of the 10 have applied for those expansion grants. Um, CCBHCs have been um, successful in states that uh, did not expand Medicaid, um, where obviously Vermont did expand Medicaid, and so we're still working through to see if that's a model um, that can be beneficial for Vermont. At one point, there was also an enhanced um, 
reimbursement rate for um, for agencies that became certified. That enhanced rate is currently on hold, uh, but I'm, we'll see if there is a, a change in that um, direction on a federal level. So we'll continue to work through that CCBHC uh, project. Um, and like I said, we're, we're in the early stages of that policy academy. So we heard there was some interest in payment reform and value-based payment models. And so we wanted to just give you a quick summary of where the Department of Mental Health is at uh, regarding payment models. We made a huge shift in 2019 away from fee-for-service um, for a large portion of our Medicaid programs. Um, we moved, we took the fee-for-service, we put it into a prospective payment model that included a value-based payment aspect. And so the goal there was to provide some more flexibility on how clients are served and um, when and where, and then create some incentives towards um, quality that the DAs also were on board with as well. So we had lots of working meetings came together and tried to align on um, you know, some, some metrics that everybody agreed should improve the system. And so taking that major step, um, which again, we found it to be very stabilizing during the pandemic, to have them on a prospective payment model versus fee for service, um, it allowed this, the system to maintain some stability in a very unstable time. We I wanted to highlight the Mental Health Integration Council because that was a legislative charge that said, hey, Vermont, we have laws on the books that said you need to have integrated mental health and health care, and yet we're, we're really not there yet. And so we're asking for these specific leaders to come together and start to take some action steps towards more integration. So that's a place where we're taking the steps that we have made through payment reform and at bringing them to the table with others. That includes One Care, it includes UVM Health Network, it includes the Blueprint for Health, um, it has other state members, it has Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and so the goal was to really gather and, and start learning from each other and see where we can align and remove barriers. So the, an example is last month, we had the UVM Health Network come and talk about their AIMS model um, and what they've done so we can learn and ideally you know, understand if you did have some interesting mechanisms for how you pay for things, because that's where a lot of us stumble is we, we can envision what we want, but then we've got these siloed payment structures. Um, so that was one. We also have had national speakers come in and talk about things like um, you know whole health integration um, and whole health models. And so we're a year in. July will be our one year anniversary where we're gonna be meeting to talk and summarize what we've learned and talk about what we wanna accomplish in the year to come. And the next slide is just an example of one of our value-based or two of our value-based payment measures. Um, thinking about why we would wanna do payment reform and what we wanna incentivize access to care was towards the top of that list. And so we brought in measures that um, looked at whether or not once you make that phone call and say you, want, you need help, how many people are given a face-to-face -face contact within five calendar days. I will tell you once COVID hit, we quickly had to change that face-to-face -to, -face to include telepsychiatry, so it, it does now. Um, and then we also have a second metric to say, okay, you got your first appointment, which is often where you decide what you need. Then how long does it take for you to actually get that service that you know you agreed that you needed? And so that's the second, um, they're sort of not in order here, but that's the 14 days with an assessment. So we've set a target for that and we'll be looking at, we use real data to then reset the targets and we're in that process now. Okay, uh, thanks, Allison. Um, so I'll take an opportunity to highlight uh, some gaps that you know we continue to uh, focus on in addition to all of this other work. Um, and I'll preface this that uh, these four um, topics are youth focused, not necessarily adult focused. Um, and that's because over the past year, and we know what's likely ahead of us um, with youth needing services or needing um, timely access to care. Um, we have seen those um, numbers increase over the last year and that need increase over the last year. We've seen um, youth who have complex 
um, medical and psychiatric needs be delayed care uh, because our system just wasn't able to appropriately serve them. So uh, I'll highlight youth inpatient capacity. Um, folks are aware all of the youth inpatient capacity for Vermont is at the Brattleboro Retreat. Um, they are um, challenged when it comes to youth who also have a significant um, medical or a complex medical issue that also needs hospitalization. And so um, we need to diversify um, and make sure that there's access to um, inpatient care for youth um, who can also uh, appropriately serve and treat those medical needs. Uh, so we are posting an RFP today um, to um, gather uh, bids um, for a youth inpatient facility. Um, or unit, uh, so that will should get posted either today or tomorrow um, to push that initiative along. Uh, additionally, we have a team of care managers that meet every day uh, that take a look at who is uh, youth who are waiting for um, inpatient care, youth who are waiting to be discharged uh, from a hospital level of care, as well as youth who are needing access to crisis beds or intensive outpatient or therapeutic foster care. Um, the whole gamut of our community resources, and we know that there are significant gaps um, across our system for access to residential care. Most of our residential uh, programs have been out of state historically. Uh, the COVID, um, COVID pandemic, along with an already looming workforce shortage, has really impacted the ability to access our out of state residential um, park care partners. Um, we know that we have ongoing waits for intensive outpatient services for youth. Um, and additionally, uh, we know that there is a significant um, gap in the availability of therapeutic foster care. Uh, so we'll be engaging in conversations across um, AHS on how to uh, bring back a, a stable uh, therapeutic foster care system for here in Vermont. So I'll highlight those gaps. Uh, DMH team, anything that I missed that you want to add to those? I think the only thing I would add is that RFP specifies that we are looking for inpatient capacity in places that can offer the co-occurring, you know, psych psychiatric and medical support. Great, thanks, Allison. Sam, anything to add from your lens? No, I don't think so. I think you covered it really well. Um, just to drive home the point of how much manpower, staff power go into it. It's the care management team really looks across the state as who's waiting for an inpatient bed, who's ready to come, breaking down all of those barriers to keep the system moving. Um, if that doesn't happen, then the backup to the emergency room is just uh, amplified. Yeah, and that's why we made the point to put these other levels of care on the list because those are the things that are needed in order for someone to leave. And so without that discharge, we don't have access. Kevin, you're on mute. I know our slideshow is not showing anymore, but the last slide was a thank you. Um, so <laughs> is, uh, we, we're at the end of the road for that, but happy to um, ha answer any questions you might have. So actually, Commissioner, I was starting to thank you, uh, <laughs> but as usual, I forget to unmute myself. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, you and your team are doing incredible work and it's not easy work and I want to thank you um, for all Vermonters for the work that you're doing each and every day. And if there's anything that we can ever do to assist you, we want to be there for that. And, you know, we've had some conversations about maybe what's the best way to um, utilize the money that UVM isn't able to put into adult beds. And I look forward to that conversation continuing. Um, just to give you a heads up, we will be sending a letter to UVM tomorrow and asking for their input on this uh, topic as well, because we need to move forward. We can't just keep saying that the problem exists in emergency rooms, which is the absolute worst place for care. 
Um, we need to do whatever we can do within the the stark reality of limited resources to uh, try to fix this. So thank you. I don't have any particular questions, but I just really wanted to thank you and your team. With that, I'll, I'll pass it to my other board members. I'll just go ahead and jump in and echo the thank you. It's really helpful for us to have um, a grounding in your larger goals and priorities and have a, a better understanding of the areas that you're working on, um, you know, so that we can make sure that we're doing our part to consider mental health issues and integration as we're proceeding with our work. So I also didn't have any questions. The presentation was very thorough and helpful. Thank you. Any other board members? No, I guess I'll just, oh, I mean, I'll, I'll just pipe in with echoing thanks as well. Um, and I'm sure, you know, from the conversations that you've had with Chair Mullen, I'm sure you understand the the perspective that we often see is around the EDs from our in our hospital budget process. And so, you know, I've been on the board now seven years and I've been hearing about the borders in, in the ED for, for a long period of time, um, adults as well as children, um, obviously. And so to me, I think, you know, I, I hope that there's, you know, continued conversation around, you know, uh, adult inpatient um, as well. And you know we are you know receiving certificate of need requests for major capital expenditures to redesign EDs to basically be able to accommodate the borders. It's, it's expensive. We hear about workforce challenges around you know uh, the, the 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 care that's um, or the the episodes of care and the ability to care for the patients that are struggling with mental health health and the need for sheriffs and sitters and all of this and so. To the degree that you know we can keep the lines of communication open between DMH and the board around these topics, I think it would be really helpful, especially as we're heading again into hospital budget season. Any things that you are doing um, on your end, and you can certainly alert us to many of these initiatives that you have now that will mitigate some of what we're hearing about um, in the EDs, I think would be really helpful just as we're thinking about hospital budgets and the need that they're expressing for the mitigation strategies that they have. And also, you know, the, the challenges that they face in um, having patients in their um, inpatient that actually really should be in a mental health setting. And so it's occupying beds that, you know, you know, that I, I know you know all this, but I'm just saying we're hearing it from our end. So anything, any strategies, any um, priorities that you're going to be emphasizing that will help mitigate that will help us, you know, informing us in terms of our hospital budget process. So a thank you. I know it's hard work, it's thankless work. So I will at least be one of three people today to thank you. <laughs> That's much appreciated. Thank you, Mac, uh, for your work. I'll just highlight that that's why you see a lot of our initiatives not necessarily focusing on inpatient capacity. It's a given that we need to diversify from the retreat, um, that we need to integrate and have medical facilities who can appropriately serve folks um, who have co-occurring um, psychiatric needs and medical needs. But you'll see a lot of our efforts, if not almost all of them, um, really targeting those folks before they get to the emergency department. Um, so thank you very much for having us here today. Much appreciated. Well, it's been our pleasure. And uh, under our, our uh, uh, rules and policies, we always open it up to public comment. So if no other board member has any comment at this time, I'm going to open it up to the public. And I see that Ham Davis has his hand raised. Ham? Thank you, Kevin. Um, this is obviously one of the most difficult issues that we have. One of the it was it rose originally because of because Pete Shellman decided to only replace half of the beds, the uh, really the heavy duty psych beds that were lost in Irene. Um, but they but it seems to me that this, in a certain sense, this issue is really easy. There isn't any money. This most single word mentioned in all of that presentation was the word gap. OK, and so what what I so what you're really looking at, and I think people ought to really get real about this is on the one hand, um, the uh, there's no way there's no way to clear those. There's no way to clear those e EDs. I've seen as many I've heard as many as 90 
people and the UVM uh, in the UVM emergency room that simply can't be moved. There's no place for them to go, and they're having huge problems with that. A nurse got beat up the other day. It's going to be it's a, so it's a horror show everywhere you everywhere you look. What I think you, we need to see, and I w would hope that the agency or the or this board or somebody would would lay out these absolute numbers so that at least we can see where where we're headed. On the one hand, there's an there's an irreducible minimum of new capability, new a bit new beds, new uh, uh, places to put people to keep people um, that is going to have to be paid for by state government. Just forget it, and if not, you're not going to get it. You, you're not going to get it without that. We need to know how much that is. What the what this what the uh, professionals really say? What is the real gap? What do you need for actual new new uh, money and new purchases and new facilities that would be paid for by state government and by bond issue if necessary? And the second thing is. You have, I think you you had a meeting here with Brumstead about two or three weeks ago. I can't remember when it was, Kevin, but it was recently. And what he told you, he he doesn't begin to have the money to do this, not even close. He does not only have the money not to build it, he doesn't have the build the money to to run it, which because it would lose a fund. So so that sits right in your board. That's in it. it so so you could. What we need to do is have some looking in mirrors here. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Is there other public comment? Hearing none, the important question going back to you, Ham, is were you able to eat it all or not? Is that, I'm sorry. We heard you say you weren't going to be able to eat it all um, during the previous conversation, so we're curious if you were able to eat it all or not. I, 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 I don't know. I've got way too much trouble with eating. I'm, I'm sorry, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> you got me there, Kevin. <laughs> Just giving you a hard time, Ham. And that's okay. <laughs> you, you, you're entitled, Kevin. <laughs> okay. Just got to teach you better control of that mute button. You have the exact opposite problem that I have. I mute myself too often, and you don't mute yourself enough. <laughs> I'm going to do it right now. Watch. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner and team from uh, DMH. Uh, really great work, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much. So next I'm going to go to um, old business of the board and I'm going to call on uh, Mike Barber and to set up um, for Mike. I just want to say that um, we made a decision a few months uh, back. I'm not sure how many months ago it was now. They all seem to roll in together, but the board designated uh, Robin and I to be the negotiators um, with the federal government and AHS for the uh, um, work on the existing and next models. And with my leaving, whether it's in two and a half weeks or a month and a half, whenever that is, um, it only makes sense that we have continued continuity, not only on the all payer model, but also on sustainability in those discussions with AHS. So I'm hopeful that the board can um, uh, move today to um, replace me in those discussions with Jessica and uh, I'll turn it over to Mike Barber. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, so you you set it up pretty well. Um, I don't really have much else to say other than I have. Uh, drafted an order. Um, obviously, I can't make a motion, but I, I have drafted an order that would um, essentially revoke uh, the previous delegation, uh, which was dated December 30th, 2020. And uh, oh, holy mackerel, I guess it yep. was a few months ago. <laughs> it's been a bit. Uh, and then um, and then delegate authority uh, to whomever you choose. Um, uh, delegate the board's authority to negotiate uh, with respect to the all payer model agreement and any subsequent agreement. And then, in addition, as you said, pursue the activities required by uh, S 285 Act 167 regarding hospital sustainability and all payer model agreement development. So, I can share that um, to help you guys. Uh, with that, if, if, if you think that'd be helpful. 
I think it would be. I mean, I think the board understands that uh, there has to be continuity on these hugely important issues. So it just makes sense. Um, we can't violate the open meeting law because we can't have more than two board members together at a time unless it's uh, an open meeting. And so it makes absolutely no sense for me to keep going and then try to provide the feedback to the, the new chair, um, which I'm more than happy to do. And anybody can call on me at any time in the future. Don't worry about that. But uh, I just think it makes so much more sense to have a board member who's going to be here throughout the process um, in those conversations. So. Robin, is there enough there for you to make a motion? Well, I feel a little awkward making a motion to delegate authority to myself, so I would prefer I'm happy to, to continue doing it, of course, and well, maybe um, Tom, Tom could make the motion since. That might be the best way to go. Does one of the Toms wish to make a motion? Sure, if Robin will tell me what to say. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend you read what Mike Barber has put on the screens, <laughs> starting All with right. delegating oh. authority to. <laughs> okay, so I move that pursuant to 18 BSA. Not 9374 D, the Green Mountain Care Board hereby delegates to board members Holmes and um, Robin <laughs> um, the board's authorities to negotiate with respect to any amendments or modifications to the all payer model agreement and any subsequent agreement and, pers and pursue activities required by Act 167. 2022 related to hospital sustainability and a subsequent all payer model agreement, including community engagement, payment model development, and regulatory design. The delegation of authority to negotiate with respect to the all payer model agreement and any subsequent agreement does not extend to the ratification of or execution of any of an agreement. Okay, Tom W., can you second that? Second it. Great. Is there discussion by the board? Hearing none, I will open it up for public comment in case any member of the public wishes to comment at this time. Hearing none, is there any further board discussion? I'll just say that I'm going to officially change my name to just Robin. <laughs> I think uh, when Mike uh, drafts the official uh, thing, it will definitely have both your full names. <laughs> okay. All those in favor of the motion, please sig signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Does anyone have any other old business to come before the board? Is there any other old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of the day.